time to bring in Sky News contributor Kosha Gator for the day's big stories. Kosha, I'll be uh, talking to Douglas Murray shortly about migration numbers. It's a massive issue across Europe, in the US, right here in Australia. And the Albanese government is under intense pressure to drastically cut net overseas migration from the record 528,000 we had last year to a promised 260,000 next year. But as Pauline Hansen noted on X, Labor doesn't have a great track record in predicting net migration numbers Accurately, over the past two years, migration has reached a record 923,000, which is 208,000 more than Labor anticipated, Hanson wrote. Uh, two questions, Kosha. Can Labor quit their high migration habit? They've seemed to have relied on that, and they're not alone. Coalition governments have also indulged in that activity and uh, can we trust their figures? Are their predictions so far out that it's almost uh, a fantasy number at the moment? Probably a little bit of both. So the, the discrepancy in the numbers uh, just fits what we've seen with government. They're, they haven't exactly covered themselves in glory in terms of their ability to report numbers accurately and model. Uh, as we've seen in many venues, the more cynical interpretation would be that maybe they well knew, but this <laughs> is a very unpopular topic, so it's easier to you know, sort of dampen the expectation a little bit and then say, oops, sorry, we miscalculated. But be that as it may, Senator Hansen's point is very well taken. This is an issue all around the world, as you said. Mm. It's the issue of our time. And those numbers, 923,000, is roughly the population of Canberra. So a whole Canberra is going to be hosted in Sydney and in, and in Melbourne, and that's kind of where these yeah. migrants concentrate and all the stress that that puts on infrastructure, on everything else, not to mention the fabric of the culture. And this is another topic uh, that's very timely right now in terms of how these different groups come in and then there's this more strife between mm. groups ethnically as well. So all of that is a predictable consequence of this. Constituents don't want it and yet it continues. Well, you can see why the Albanese government is pledging to drastically cut these numbers. They're getting prepared for the next federal election and they know this is an enormous issue out there. Um, now let's talk about Labor Senator Fatima Payman, who is a uh, calling on the Albanese government to sanction and disinvest from Israel, accusing the country of genocide against the Palestinian people. How many mass graves need to be uncovered before we say enough? How many images of bloodied limbs of murdered children must we see? How many horrors need to be repeated before we feel that this should end? How many Palestinian lives are enough to call this violence against them terrorism? Kosha, she also used the phrase from the river to the sea, which the Prime Minister has been clear to, to condemn, to say that it's a uh, statement that promotes violence. And here he's got a senator saying it. He's got a problem on his hands, as do his counterparts everywhere. So I look at the senator, uh, the same thing with the United States Congress, Rashida Tlaib, Ilan Omar. It comes downstream from immigration, that topic we talked about again. This is some of those longer term consequences, whether intended or unintended, coming home to roost uh, in many ways. But right within the left side of politics and liberal democracies, it's really coming home to roost because yeah. there's a, a huge refracturing and realignment of the fault lines in that party. And I think that colors what you see in terms of their positions with respect to Israel, with respect to protesters, with all of that, because they're kind of speaking, they've become a two-headed beast in yeah. a way, and they're speaking to two factions that don't agree on this issue. That's it. The Biden administration has got these issues as well. And talking about the left of politics, Senator Lydia Thorpe has posted this image of herself with the message, got my kefir on for Parliament today, power to all the students camped out and everyone that's been coming to rallies and standing up for justice. Shame on Vic Labor for banning kefirs in Parliament there. A real gammon lot they are, free Palestine. Uh, Really, the Australian Upper House is disgracing itself. What did Paul Keating call them? An unrepresentative swill. I think he was being kind. Uh, now, let's move on to Albo evicting one of his tenants from one of his investment properties. Uh, this is uh, an incredible story. Jim Flanagan was handed an eviction notice on the 8th of May to vacate the three-bedroom townhouse where he's lived for four years. The PM has said... I've had him in the property with the rent being about half what is the market rent 
to keep him in for longer. So this is very interesting indeed. The PM must be a saint just giving away free rent there, essentially. Uh, but I do question the, uh, the wisdom of evicting a tenant during his prime ministership. You would just think, yeah, sure, if you were an everyday, ordinary person who wasn't in public office, you may make this decision, but the optics here are not great. That's a very interesting point. Uh, you could say that it's principled and he's saying, hey, if you know, I want to evict my tenant, I'm going to do that. And I guess that's right. You could mm. say it would be nice if our leaders showed principled consistency on all sorts of other issues, including ones that don't directly affect them. But uh, you know, I think it's a fair argument on the facts of the case. It's his right as a landlord to do that. But uh, the optics are interesting and he's injected something that becomes a proxy mm. story for all sorts of issues people have with housing and rent prices and cost of living and all of that, they can project onto that those pain points and he's invited that upon himself. And this is very different to that image of himself that is cultivated. You know, he grew up in a commission house, he's, you know, he's from Labor's socialist left faction and yet he's got multi-million dollar investment properties. Uh, yep. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, I'm just saying when you fight the culture wars and uh, also, uh, you know, paint this image of uh, I'm fighting the Tories and the rich don't do this and the rich don't do that and you're part so of the... True. Part All around the world, the zip code outside DC is the wealthiest zip code in the world, one of them, and it's the same, same point. Absolutely. Now, Liberal Senator Alex Antic has called out big tech companies who employ former intelligence um, employees and conspire with governments to censor and ban speech. Big tech is the perfect intersection between government, the ruling class and the intelligence services along with their mates in big business. You see what they want you to see. Australia is at the tip of the spear of the global censorship movement. And I suspect that many who are involved are blissfully unaware and think that they're doing the right thing by shutting down and deleting so-called mis- and disinformation. But let's be clear, the government isn't thinking about your safety and it doesn't care about misinformation. What it cares about is making sure that you see an approved message at all times. What is said in Parliament this week uh, has been established by investigative journalists Kosher, including Michael Schellenberger, who we've interviewed on this program. This is a huge issue because these platforms are now the digital public square. This is where people discuss issues, but this is where they find out information. It is. He's one of the few elected leaders direct enough and brave enough to say that. It really is a convergence of all these power structures. As he mentioned, it's big tech, it's government, people who aid and abet it, like the e-safety commissioner and others, uh, and just other people at the top, the ruling class, um, I think, as he put it, is the issue. We've called it the battlefield of the century, in a way. It's another day in that movement. The problem is that for a country like Australia, certainly we shouldn't be aiding and abetting things, like with the e-safety commissioner, but there's little recourse, little remedy we really have in terms of trying to break up that power that big tech plays in it, since they're all headquartered in the United States. That's the belly of the beast where something has to happen along the lines of antitrust law, along the lines of Section 230, where they're not penalized yeah, The problem is we seem to be among some of the worst in the free world in uh, uh, suppressing mm -hmm. free speech. Uh, so not only are we not fighting it, we, we seem to be one of the worst in, uh, in um, uh, aiding and abetting it. Uh, Kosher Gator, thank you so much for your time Thanks. this evening.